your time for everyone um, uh, for coming uh, for this uh, uh, presentation or this user group. Well, um, my name is Desmond, okay, and uh, yeah, I'm one of the co-leaders with NG as well, okay. Um, we normally do this. We normally we normally do this. We normally do this um, uh, once every two months, and we get um, speakers to come to speak for us on certain topics on uh, regarding Salesforce itself. So today we are honored to have uh, Shari with us to speak about his core compliance and uh, implementing data and privacy. Okay. So uh, NG, you want to say something? Uh, no, actually, it's that uh, yeah, we are looking forward uh, to welcome uh, Sarab to to present his uh, yeah to share with us uh, what his uh, data privacy is all about. Mm, okay, cool. Thanks, thanks, Ng. To you, Sarab. All right. Thank you so much, uh, you Desmond. Share, share, Sarah, if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Just a sec. All right. Can you can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Sarab Gupta. Can you see my screen? Yes. Sure. Cool. Yep. Nice. Yeah. See the Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Like I said, my name is Sarab Gupta. Thank you for having me. Um, let's very quickly start with a disclaimer. Uh, this is not legal advice. Um, we are. We don't represent Salesforce's point of view. We are a Salesforce partner. But this is really our perspective based on uh, a lot of research, talking with a lot of customers, and a lot of reading on data privacy. Um, we are also a partner with Adobe. So if you have Marketo uh, type solutions, we also integrate with them. Uh, a little bit of background on me. Uh, my name is Saurabh Gupta. I, I spent about seven and a half years at Salesforce here in, uh, in the US. I'm based in Chicago. Uh, and then about two and a half years ago, uh, I founded Cloud Compliance. Um, my background is mostly in enterprise architecture and technology. Um, I do have a, a business and a design uh, background as well. Uh, I like to think of myself as an avid problem solver, and I've blogged quite frequently on our company blog page and on LinkedIn. I would definitely encourage you to connect with me on LinkedIn uh, if you like after this event. Um, so a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Um, we'll start with a little bit of context on what data privacy laws are about and why um, we should be concerned about them um, from our employer or if you're in consulting from your client's perspective. Uh, we'll dive uh, a little bit into what kind of technology capabilities are required, some Salesforce uh, features and considerations. Uh, we also have a free app on App Exchange for data masking that you can uh, take benefit off and I'll share a link for it and uh, some of the other resources. And then, uh, you know, we type in your questions in the meantime in the chat and we'll definitely uh, get into them. I also have Aniket here on the call. Uh, so if there's anything else, uh, you know, just, Aniket, just share the links of uh, things as they come up, if you would, please. Um, so with that in the background, uh, let's dive in. Let's start with why do we really need to bother with data privacy laws? Um, so what's happened around the world is as technology has uh, given incredible capabilities to us to market and harvest data and track people on the internet, um, come, uh, you know, countries around the world and regions have woken up to this and this is just law catching up with it. And um, most privacy laws around the world require businesses to now treat personal data fairly transparently and lawfully. Those, all those three things have legal implications. Uh, and what that means is information about your prospects, customers, consumers, employees, partners, and anybody else, any kind of personal data, you need to have certain processes around it. And you need to have certain controls and governance to ensure that um, it's treated appropriately. It also means tangibly that as individuals, we all have been given specific rights that businesses that process our information, which means they store and manage it, they're required to address those rights. The things that's very unique about some of these regulations, particularly like GDPR, is that they have a cross-border enforcement. What that means is you may be a company based in Singapore or China or India or anywhere else in the world, United States, uh, but uh, you know some of these regulations can go after you. In the past, 
if you were based in the country where a law was, you only had to follow the law of the land. Privacy laws change that. So it's a very important distinction. And they do come with some teeth. So, you know, if there is a violation, uh, the appropriate regulatory authorities can fine uh, the organization. And those fines can be quite significant. It's about 4% of annual revenue for GDPR. CCPA here in the uh, United States, CCPA is the Californian law. And we have a couple of other state level laws. So CDPA from Virginia and such. Singapore has PDPA that just got revised, I think, in November of 2020. And that also comes with fines. And I'll go a little bit into what this means. Uh, but predominantly, more than the fines that come with laws, um, a very important reason to, uh, to be on the forefront of data privacy is customer trust, right? We don't trust companies that uh, do not follow good practices, that may breach our information, that send us unsolicited emails or phone calls and things like that. So from a brand perspective, uh, there is an incredible desire for marketers and businesses to make sure that they continue to build trust. Uh, some of you may have seen that Apple is taking a very strong position on privacy, and that's something that they espouse as part of their brand. And that's sort of the mentality that you see with a lot of forward-looking visionary businesses. Uh, there are also very strong monetary reasons for doing it. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier about fines, an average fine under GDPR can be up to $81,000. Um, a data breach has direct impact on stock prices. So if you work for a for-profit listed company, you know that is something to be very much aware of. So what's happening worldwide right now is really interesting. Uh, there is a ton of regulations all across the world that have been either enforced or are getting enforced, are in the process of. So what you see in red on, on the right-hand side of this are some of the countries or regions where regulations are, are in, in progress. Uh, the thing that's interesting is uh, China just released uh, an updated version of, uh, of their, their privacy law, and India has one that's sitting in the, in, in the Indian parliament. Uh, with these two countries uh, enforcing data privacy laws, you would have you would see about 60, 65 percent of the world population under data privacy laws. So there is a significant uh, push in this direction, and this is specifically important if you're you know if you are a global company, um, if you do business in any of these geographies. Um, all of a sudden, now there are obligations for your company. And these obligations have a direct impact on Salesforce. Why? Because if there is one system in your enterprise that has personal data, it's probably Salesforce, right? We have contact information. We have leads that have personal data. We have users that have personal data. So a lot of objects in Salesforce can have personal data. And so that's kind of what we will dive into next. Um, I added another slide here for Singapore PDPA. Uh, so we actually recently uh, uh, onboarded two customers in Singapore, um, and uh, you know we are, we are seeing a lot of interest in Asia Pacific in general. So from India, Australia, uh, you know, and a little bit more in the Mediterranean part of the uh, Europe as well. So uh, essentially, when you look at Singapore's PDPA, a lot of requirements here, and in general with most privacy laws, are fairly similar. There is um, a clear uh, consent that uh, organizations need to have when they're collecting personal data. So if you're filling a, you know, a form, so for example, the form for this event, or if you're filling a lead gen form, downloading a PDF, getting more information, getting a quote, um, you know, organizations are required to ask for an explicit consent for marketing and other activities. Uh, there is a limitation or purpose limitation of the information you're collecting. If you said you're collecting it for servicing your customers, you can only use it for those purposes. You can't then turn around and use it for marketing or some other purposes. Uh, there needs to be a, a retention policy in place to ensure that, you know, if you collect information, you have a policy which says, okay, you know, X customer data I only keep for four years or six years or whatever. And there are different laws in different regions around these, but fundamentally, you need to have retention policies. Uh, from a access and uh, correction and data portability perspective, 
what needs to happen is we now have a right to ask any business that has our information to be provided that information. And those businesses are obligated to do that. That's what's referred to as data portability. Um, another one is right to be forgotten where someone can make a request and say, hey, remove my data. And those businesses are now required to do that. So doing a number of these things in Salesforce can be somewhat tricky. Let me uh, go a little bit more into what it specifically means for Salesforce. So these are the six key requirements that we typically hear from uh, Salesforce uh, customers. The One of the first ones that is very commonly needed is data portability and right to be forgotten for Salesforce. And so the idea here is when you request your information, someone can go inside Salesforce and pull all the appropriate data for you. So it may be your contact record. It may be related opportunities, cases, assets, custom objects that you may have, right? Um, a lot of that kind of data you're required to provide. And the term portability in data portability means that it has to be a portable format. So it has to be a PDF or a CSV, you know, format that is commonly accepted. Um, similarly, for a right to be forgotten, uh, you need to either delete that information in Salesforce or anonymize it. A vast majority of customers that we work with, they prefer anonymizing data instead of deleting it. And basically what happens in anonymization is we wipe out all the personal data. So on a contact record for Saurabh Gupta, it doesn't say Saurabh Gupta anymore. It says ABC, XYZ, something like that, right? And what that does is it doesn't break your reports. It doesn't break your uh, dashboards. If you're doing um, you know, uh, KPIs and metrics on things like campaign effectiveness. Um, so all of those work because you haven't deleted. You can maintain integrity with other systems that you may have and things like that. But that's the first requirement. So a good example of this is uh, actually on our website, if you go down, you will see that you can make a request for any of these things. Uh, and that's all running from Salesforce uh, using our product. Um, you need a process for this, which should start from uh, getting an email or you know a form where someone fills it and then have it as a case inside Salesforce, a DSAR type case, which is kind of what our product does. And then you can click two buttons and essentially pull all the relevant data. The second part of this is very much around data retention and minimization. And the idea is that you have retention policies and uh, you automate this data uh, anonymization or deletion inside Salesforce. So if you have a policy that we keep X customer data in Salesforce for uh, no more than six years, I think it's six or seven in Australia. Um, so if you're doing something like that, then what you want to do is you want to set up a system inside Salesforce that's monitoring information and goes, oh, it meets the criteria and then it anonymizes it. So you may anonymize contact data and you may have a ton of other data, like tasks and other that you just want to delete. So again, that's kind of the space we work in. So we can you know, automatically do that. Uh, and we do that for a lot of our customers. Um, the third part of this, which is really interesting and quite complex, and I know someone mentioned that they, they come from a marketing cloud background. This is really uh, uh, one of the more difficult things, and we have a, we just signed a customer in Singapore that wants to do this. Um, so the idea here is to maintain opt-in and opt-out preferences. When someone fills a form and they checked that, hey, email me or do not email me, uh, or contact me for marketing, but not don't send me an SMS, things like that. So those kind of granular preferences you can manage in Salesforce. Uh, Salesforce has a couple of objects, uh, notably known as individual contact point type consent and some of the other ones. It's just that it's just not that easy to be able to use them. So what we've done is we have uh, built our product on top of those objects and we basically help you do the entire consent management life cycle. We also synchronize these dates with uh, you know, tech tools like Marketing Cloud, Pardot, Marketo, MailChimp, Eloqua, and such. Uh, and the idea of this is with this MarTech integration, you can do omni-channel marketing. So if you uh, need to reach out to people on WeChat, for example, in China, or you know, on WhatsApp, or SMS, or so other social channels, or email, all of those concerns then get centralized in Salesforce, and that way you can manage and maintain them there. 
and uh, you know we provide a consent uh, management um, uh, capable self service capability as part of our privacy center that runs on communities and essentially you can allow people to uh, automatically manage their concerns to portability things like that um, I've written a lot about these on LinkedIn and on our on our on our website, and uh, we'll share the link. Uh, Aniket, if you don't mind, just add the links to our website blog and to uh, our LinkedIn articles in the chat, please. Sure. Um, yeah. So the fourth part of this is about data masking. Uh, this has become significantly more uh, important in the last six months. You know, the recent spate of cyber attacks and cyber intrusions that happened worldwide you know with solar winds and some uh, us um, utility companies and food companies what's happened is that a lot of salesforce customers do not want real data in sandboxes so when you create a full or a partial copy sandbox the information is just copied over from your production into sandboxes and now these sandboxes typically have lower uh, security controls and you have uh, a lot of people in there with admin access. So the data that you could never ever see in production is just mostly free for all in sandbox. And that's another area where um, we do a lot of work. Uh, we do data masking and uh, you know that we have a free product on App Exchange. I would very much encourage you to try um, and definitely give us feedback. And Aniket is on this call, who's our product manager and very instrumental in building that product. So definitely um, give it a shot. Um, the one of the other aspects is to generate an inventory of personal data. So the intention here is that if you are a business, you need to have uh, an inventory under GDPR. It's known as Record of Proce Processing Activities or ROPA. So you need to have this inventory of personal data, which means what kind of information do you capture? Where do you keep it? What basis do you capture it for um, and how for how long do you keep it? This is a very sort of simple high level version of it. So what we allow, what we enable our customers to do is you can literally click a button inside Salesforce with our product and we would basically scan and inventorize your entire Salesforce org metadata. So we will pull all your objects, all the fields. We will indicate what we think is potential personally identifiable information or PII. And then you can, uh, you know, uh, add additional attributes to it, like who owns it, how long do you keep it for, why do you keep it, is it encrypted, do you need consent, all of that kind of stuff. These, this is typically a very common requirement under most privacy laws, along with the others that we've described. So finally, um, you know, there is always there is a lot of need around transparency in in most privacy laws, and what we do is we uh, have policy and notice management. Uh, this is again something you can see on our website or i'll show in a minute um and the idea here is that you have policies which are uh, very clear to uh to your uh, data subjects or people who you do business with and um, these policies uh are in multiple languages support uh, different text from multiple regions and uh, you know if someone accepts a particular policy you may need to keep a, a proof of acceptance uh, and we enable our customers to do all of these things. Um, so before I go any more in presentation, let me quickly jump to my our website and just give you a little bit of taste of this. We're not gonna do a, a whole demo here, but uh, hopefully you'd get to see what this looks like and you can probably look at it. So this is our website. If I go all the way to the bottom of it, um, you know these are uh, some of the uh, things that we were talking about here, right? So like if I go to my privacy policy, um, what you would see is, you know, we navigated to this page. This is a Salesforce communities page, and this is our product running here. And everything that you look at on this page is is really just a record in Salesforce. Um, now you, we can also have multilingual uh, policies here. So I have in different languages. You can have it for different countries here if you know that was of interest. So I may have a completely different policy for Spain, for example, versus I have for United States very relevant for global organizations. And then you can see how that part works, right? Similarly, uh, you know, I can have a right to be forgotten here. So you, know, you click this, you get to a page, you can make a request. So if you enter your email address here, and if you exist in our Salesforce org, we will send you and we will email you a link 
and you can click that link and you can come here and make your uh, data subject access request. Similarly, for consent management, you can click a link, come here, you know, uh, manage your consents. So I would encourage you uh, after this call, if you get a chance, to definitely uh, look up uh, uh, any of these features that are of interest. We provide a lot of information on our website. So you can uh, you know, definitely go take a look at what specific things to look at. Uh, it's also quite useful because you get a sense of what kind of requirements to think about. So if you have projects going internally, you can ask those questions of, well, what about this? You know, Do we need to have a retention policy? What's the level of accuracy you need on that retention policy? Do you need to do it for specific things? What's literally the where clause in that, right? Things like that. Uh, we also cover, uh, you know, certain regulations here. So you can look at, you know, uh, if you're doing like GDPR coverage, for example. Unfortunately, I don't have one for Singapore. But the idea is you can look at this and see what articles apply, what is the reason for doing it. You know, this is like for DPI or ROPA and so on and so forth. So this is relevant, uh, you know, if you have business or legal folks, you can kind of have that conversation with them, maybe point them to this and say, hey, this is what are some of the things from a Salesforce perspective. Um, so switching back here uh, for a minute, uh, another example that is very interesting, and uh, you know, we, we can we'll share the link for this as well uh, in a bit, is this compliance matrix that we have created. And this, again, is a very, basically, it's uh, the summary version of what I was just explaining. So for GDPR, CCPA, for India's PDPB, you know, these are some of the capabilities uh, of within Salesforce, and this is specific to Salesforce. These are the related, uh, you know, articles and, and clauses. Um, again, we are not a law firm, so this is for informational purpose only, but it's a good, uh, you know, uh, way to look at some of the things. Um, all my background is in implementations. So when I look at things, I want to kind of align them to, to themes, if you will, and epics, you know, from an agile perspective. So the things on top here is really sort of the epics that I can think of. And I go, okay, we'll create these things as part of data minimization and retention and so on and so forth. Um, so let's go quickly back and see uh, what else is uh, there here. Uh, let me quickly get to the build of this. Take a minute here and drink some water. So we spoke with a ton of customers all over the world. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, I didn't get to travel all over the world, but I did Zoom calls in US, Europe, um, Asia Pacific, a lot of places. What we have heard from customers everywhere boils down to this. Nobody wants to be fined, sued, embarrassed, right? Nobody wants to be in news like these guys were, right? So. People want to do the right thing as companies, as professionals, we all want to do the right things. And we want to do right things from a technology perspective also. We want solutions you know, that address these privacy concerns and address it in a manner so that you don't have a lot of technical debt. You're doing architecturally a sound solution. And that's where I think a lot of customers are challenged uh, to, to find a balance between meeting compliance requirements, doing it in a manner which is not super expensive, and also doing it in a manner which is forward-looking, future-ready. And that's kind of what has gone into our thinking as we design these products. So um, one of the questions that we almost always get is, why even do it in Salesforce, right? I have some other technology, right? You may have OneTrust, you may have TrustArc, you may have a ton of other technologies. Uh, you know, you may have segment.io. There's like a ton of technology solutions that allow you to do data privacy. Why should I do this in Salesforce? So the whole point of this, this is a comparison of what happens when you do it with a standalone app or if you do it just inside Salesforce with something like cloud compliance. So first and foremost is the idea of adoption and learning curve, right? If you're doing it inside Salesforce, you're people know Salesforce, right? It's easier, there's already an investment in it. Um, you know, uh, you don't have to kind of buy something new, buy sandbox licenses, figure out how to use it, build your release around it, do all that. By doing it inside Salesforce, 
you get the full power of the platform. You can do workflows, process builders, flows, approvals, so on and so forth, right? If you can't figure something out, there's a ton of packages on the app exchange, including what we, we, we provide. You can also write Apex if you need to. The other part is because you primarily are trying to work with personal data, you have a CRM system that has personal data. If you buy a third party app, you have to actually push this data over into that app for it to do portability or right to be forgotten, things like that. And finally, over the years, that cost of integration keeps on increasing on the left. Typically, what happens is if you have Salesforce and if you have a marketing uh, technology or multiple marketing technology, you can almost be certain they're integrated with Salesforce. So your email tools are integrated, your SMS tools are integrated. If you're doing event management tools, they are integrated. And the advantage of that approach is you can now centralize your consents inside Salesforce and you know Saurabh opted out. So, hey, Marketing Cloud, don't send an email to Saurabh and things like that. Here is an example of a customer. Uh, this is a nonprofit, Norwegian Refugee Council, great customer. And uh, they utilize our product for managing their consents. They have half a million consents. Uh, and uh, you know they are obviously in Norway, so there's a lot of GDPR uh, related considerations that they have to look at. So they uh, you know automate their portability uh, and you know they get their uh, target data privacy. Uh, very well done with us. They're a pretty old customer of ours, and they're now doing data masking as well. Um, Clear Choice is a healthcare company here in the US, and they wanted to do it for uh, CCPA, which is the Californian uh, uh, Privacy Act. And again, this is predominantly for portability and right to be forgotten. Um, again, an example of a customer, mid-sized company, very, very easy for them to work with us. And you know, most of our tools are, all of our tools actually are declarative. So once uh, you know they are set up, then you can just easily use them yourself. You don't need to write code. You don't need us to help you. Essentially, after the initial setup, you know, it's really easy for people to take over and, and use them. Uh, this is another example from education. So EF education is based in uh, the UK and uh, they wanted to have a consent uh, preference, uh, consent management and marketing preference center. And uh, this integrates with PowerDot and um, we we do that for them. Uh, and they also have their homegrown app. I think it's a .NET app. And uh, you know we have APIs for all of our products. So they basically uh, manage consents within Salesforce from their homegrown app. Uh, where the students can go in and they can say, send me notifications for class reminder and other things. And all of that is stored. Those preferences are stored inside Salesforce through cloud compliance. And so when they have to notify them, whether in app or through SMS, they look at cloud compliance, say, okay, what did Saurabh say for this? Oh, Saurabh said that he wants to be notified for classes. So send him an SMS or whatever notification you'd like. Um, so Data Masker is a, one of the products that we are very excited about, and we have a free version, makes it super easy to try it. Um, and the idea there is I have information in production as it goes into sandboxes. It's pretty much copied as is. And what Data Masking does is it's uh, on platform, so it's right built on top of Salesforce using Salesforce technologies. And we basically, our product just essentially masks all the data that you have configured it. So. It's still very realistic data, but it's not real data. Uh, you can get this app for free on App Exchange. Uh, and uh, Aniket, if you would please uh, share a link for that, or if you guys want to make a note, it's just Bitly Sandbox Masker. You can also search for uh, uh, Cloud Compliance or Data Masker on App Exchange, and you'll find it. Um, uh, I wanted to take a note and thank, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, Singapore Institute of Management. They are using our free uh, data masker tool. Um, and uh, essentially, this is a recommendation that we got from them. Um, so we appreciate that very much. And my, I'm a technologist. So my recommendation to everyone is, you know, the proof of any solution in technology is in the pudding, right? You have to try it. And we make that very easy. This is a free product. Go download it, try it out. It'll take you less than 30 minutes to set it up. As soon as you download it, we send you an email with all the instructions. You can just do it yourself. Really good way to understand what you can do for your customers. Um, and if you're in consulting, uh, definitely uh, you know 
help your customers understand this. This is not an easy uh, uh, problem to solve and not a cheap problem to solve. Some of the uh, options to get data masking are quite expensive. So definitely something worth looking at. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, we do a lot of other things, and that's our flagship product, uh, Cloud Compliance Privacy Suite. Again, it's on App Exchange. And same thing, you could leverage this for data privacy, consent, and data retention. Uh, for this, you would need to have a conversation with us, and we'll need to understand your requirements better. Um, if you reach out to us on our website, uh, there is uh, right up top is a big blue button to uh, set up a time with us. Um, and Naniket, if you don't mind, you could probably share that link too. Um, so really, this is a, a very quick uh, overview of uh, all things data privacy um, and how you could do them in Salesforce. There is a lot more to uh, talk about on any of these topics. But what I'd like to do is uh, see if there are specific questions and help answer them and then kind of get into more details to those specific questions. I want to take a look at the chat. All right. Uh, yeah, we had a question from Fanindra Saurabh. Yep. Unfortunately, he, I think, left. But Wait, what's the question? So can if mask phone fields, you know, a managed package field? If they are having from CTI. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, can we? Uh, so uh, help me understand, Desmond. How much time do we have left? Ah, uh, hi. Uh, uh, let me see. I put my yeah. Um, okay. Uh, you still have uh, I think uh, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, All right. Just normally, I'll, we... I'll do my sessions by eight thirty. I will. Uh, okay. I'll end. Yeah, but you can you can you can extend you if you need to. Yeah. Okay. So no issues. Can... Let's do a really quick demo then. Is that okay? I can just yeah, show it. Yeah, I think it'll question. be great to see the demo as well. All right. Let's see data masking. That's kind of the uh, one of the easiest products to see very, very quickly. And I like the fact that it's available for free at App Exchange. So come on, Google. <laughs> All right. Let me log in here. Okay, give me a sec, and we'll load this thing. So what I'm going to show you is uh, data masking. Um, and this is a really quick demo uh, and a very, very easy product to use. And again, available on App Exchange. So definitely get it. Um, all right, let's go to right here on Data Masker. Uh, so this is a Salesforce native app, which means your data doesn't go anywhere. We don't send it to Amazon Web Services or something else to you know uh, to process it. So the way this works is what data masking does is you can apply masking to any field on any object in your org, whether that object is custom, standard, or managed package. It doesn't matter. So uh, it starts with a rich set of patterns. So. We've put some patterns here uh, in this demo environment, and you can create your own custom patterns. So like I have one for Japanese first and last names. You can have for Chinese or whatever other languages you're working with. Great way to have mask your data from a training perspective for different cultures if you're training in different cultures. All right. Uh, and so the way this works is you, know, uh, you create a, a, what we call a configuration. And think of configuration as the end state of your sandbox. Once you're done with data masking on a sandbox, what do you want it to look like, right? Um, and that's kind of what we do here. Uh, when you uh, apply this data masking configuration, you, so you set this app up uh, in your production, you configure this thing, and then when you create sandboxes or you refresh sandboxes, this app along with this configuration is in your sandbox. And then you can click a button or automate it and it would automatically mask everything. As part of that masking, you can have uh, org-wide settings. So you can say delete all the files and attachments, delete all chatter, case comments, email, field history, all of that, right? Uh, you can also notify users when this masking is done and do a bunch of other things that we'll get into in a minute. But then the interesting thing is, at an object level, what can you do, right? So you can say, I'm just going to go to contact here. So you can say for the contact object, 
I want some of this information to be masked. I want the department value to be erased. So there will be nothing. We'll replace it basically with a null. Um, and I want to change these other things. I want to just generate random email addresses, which we can do. I want to you know, apply some pattern or a custom list, right? So this is the list that I was referring to earlier. So I want first name to be in Japanese. I want last name to be Japanese names. And you can add other sample things, so Thai or whatever language you're working with, you can do that. I want phone numbers to be in a UK format, US format, Australian format. All of these are very configurable. You can add your new ones if you like, or you can use what we already have. So if I go here, and click new, I'm going to quickly try and add a field to this. So my choices are, do I erase or do I replace? I'm just going to say I'll replace. And you can see how easy this is. And I'm just going to say, in this case, I'm just going to say, you know what? I'm going to put a hard-coded value. I could have said, uh, apply a custom list or regex. Um, let's take, I don't know, regex seems more fun. Uh, let's do that. And let's apply it on this field, assistant <laughs> phone. So basically, we take the phone number. And we would, uh, you know, just generate random phone numbers in one of these formats. I'm going to take phone number UK here and hit save. That's really it. <laughs> That's it. You do this much. And when you run this thing, um, you know, data mask is going to go to contact fields and it would change this. And we can do this across all kinds of objects. So basically, if I go back to my configuration, I can go here. I can click this button here and I can run this. I can run it for all uh, the objects that I've configured masking. I can run it for just one object uh, at a time, which is great if you're testing stuff and you're like, I don't want this to run and change all my sandbox data. I only want to do you know, specific. You can also run, if you ran this and it ran into some problems, then you can also um, run it for error records. So very, very you know, easy ways to kind of run this thing and make sure that it works for you. Um, you know, like I mentioned, uh, Singapore Institute of Management uh, tries our, they have our free version of this. And uh, the whole intention of that, from what I understand, was just how simple it was to use. Um, we have a customer in Australia that we are working with. They want to do far more complex things, and we support them. You can also run our tool from, uh, you know, CI, CD, or DevOps uh, automation. So if you use Copardo, flow some Jenkins, uh, gear set, uh, or you know, auto rabbit or anything else, those tools can also fire our data masker. So we, uh, without writing any code, we expose this uh, so that you can just call from any schedule or any external thing, and you can run this if you like. Um, once it's executed, uh, what happens is you are able to then actually see you know, all the execution, what it did, how it worked, right? So I can go here and it'll show me that, you know, th this is just a demo environment. So it's only a thousand records. We typically run it for millions. Um, but you can look at this and say, okay, I ran this. I had thousand records in. How many were masked? All of that happened. How long did it take? Things like that. So that's a really quick uh, five minute overview of Data Masker. Uh, we are working on a new version that comes out uh, very shortly. And we are adding an incredible amount of features that will do automated scanning of metadata. So it will pull all, you know, it will scan through all the object, all the fields looking for PII and identifying it. Uh, it will make recommendations on what fields to mask in what objects. This is really compelling, especially if you are, you know, working in very large, very complex environments. We have customers that we are, you know, that have rec requirements that they have 2,000 custom objects. You know, like very, very large, very complex environments where it becomes very hard to figure out what to mask. Uh, we can do an automated scan and we can come up with recommendations, and then we can uh, basically auto-generate these, uh, the con like the configuration I was showing you. So you don't have to manually create it. It'll show you all that. It'll say, hey, do you, these are the fields we think have PII. And you could just say accept, you know, require recommendations, and we'll create that, and you can run this thing. We are also adding a feature for auto coverage, and what that does is it, you know, scans your org on every week basis, and if it finds new stuff, it'll notify you. And after 30, 60, 90 days, whatever you configure it, it would automatically update the configuration so that next time when you uh, run masking, those new fields and their values also get masked. So lots of very exciting stuff happening in this space. Uh, 
The other area that is uh, quite interesting for our customers is uh, data retention and minimization. And uh, you know those two directly uh, appeal to uh, data security. And so uh, that's something that a lot of our customers are interested in. So I'm not going to give you another demo, but I want to show you a little bit of how easy it is for uh, our customers to um, to do these things uh, and you know how declaratively we have designed everything here. And hopefully that's just another minute or so. Aniket, are there any other questions? Because I'm not looking at the chat right now. No, just Manu had a doubt that whether Flossum also does data masking, I guess. So whether the Flossum data masking feature is using our data mask behind the scene. No, no. So there's a lot of CI CD tools that do data masking. Um, the challenge with most of them that I understand is you know, they do it for a limited number of records because that's not their key use case. Uh, we also uh, get into a lot of other areas, you know, like how invocation automatically doing the coverage of it, a lot of metadata discovery of what to do. Those kind of things are much harder to do with too. So we are a very purpose-built tool. You know, it's the difference between, uh, you know, buying a, a very surgical instrument versus buying, uh, you know, using a kitchen knife. So I think that's kind of how I, I would describe us. We are more on the surgical instrument side in terms of our precision and what we do for our customers. So this is like really the sort of a simple view of uh, our uh, you know product setup. When you look at things like data retention, right to be forgotten, all of that, it's all very declarative in its setup. So you know, for data retention, we literally do like a three-step process. You go, okay, what object? You know, we configure mappings for our clients. And then uh, you know we just basically apply a mapping, give it a schedule, and data uh, and uh, uh, cloud compliance would automatically run at that time, and just basically make sure that your data retention is done. So here's an example, right? We're doing it on this object. We put a where clause to make sure we only do it for specific records, and you can have multiple of these on the same object. So if you have different policies for contacts in Asia Pacific versus Europe versus US, you can do that. Uh, and you can basically schedule it. Uh, literally everything that we've done, as you can see in Data Masker and in this product, is all very much designed to be simple to use. Uh, none of the features from a data privacy perspective that we have require you to you know, write code or you know, learn a new technology. It's all native Salesforce. Uh, and there is a lot of other areas that we get into specific to like data subject access request, you know, con a consent audit log, data vault, things like that. Finally, one quick end, uh, you know, result of some of these things that I wanted to uh, show you is you're looking here at, uh, you know, contact records and it's the same with leads. For consent management, what we do is you can uh, see like I have all my consents here for Saurabh, and you can see that Saurabh opted out in some, he's opted into some, and any all of these are actually records in the background. They're records of a thing called contact point type consent. It's a Salesforce provided object. Uh, this part is not easy to do, I can tell you. Like So these objects exist in your Salesforce org today. The individual object, the contact point type and consent, there's like, I forgot, 20 plus objects that Salesforce has provided in the last couple of years. But that's all you have. You have objects. So the whole glue of how to automate, how to uh, move these things around, how to create individuals, that's all the stuff we do. And these consents and their opt-in dates is what we would then synchronize with your marketing technologies. And then that way, you can make sure that all your marketing is compliant to you know, your local privacy laws, and you're not sending emails to people who actually opted out. So. Um, that is the 50,000 foot view of some of the things that we were talking. I know we are probably almost at time. So I'm going to turn over to all of you. If you have questions um, that we can answer, if there's anything else um, that Desmond or Angie, if you'd like to add, or Aniket. I'm good. Yeah, hi, everyone. Do you have any questions to Sharab and uh, and, uh, and the kid? Um, I see there's some chats that's going on uh, on, yeah. on the other end. But do you all, if you all if you all want to ask a question here, you can uh, unmute yourself, and then you can ask it here as well. Is there anyone? 
So if, if no one has a question, then I have a question for people who are attending. Is this, do you see these areas and what is the biggest challenge you see in, in, in these, you know, privacy uh, type discussions? That happening are they happening in your company one and if they are what are what what seems to be the biggest challenge mm. okay mm. okay food for thought that was good um for that questioning um i guess yeah it's i mean okay so uh for shut up uh one of my one of my uh needs actually was uh i'm actually from sim uh, so one of my leads was in contact with Sharap and they were they were showing us the demo of what cloud compliance can do. Okay, I I uh, I, I felt that it was good uh, on the data masking portion. Uh, there was quite a lot of things that they could have done it for us. Uh, we are still evaluating, so uh, we are not actually a uh, customer as the customer say. Uh, <laughs> we, are still, <laughs> we are still using the data masking free uh, at the moment right now. Okay, so it's uh, a wonderful thing. Um, as I say, um, data protection is we are in Singapore itself is really really important. There's a lot, very high fine that is on this thing as well. And uh, as for SIM side, we have a lot of uh, personal data. I think every company as well they really have a lot of personal data they need to get, especially in the context side. So um, do reach out to him and also use the the free app that he has as well. Okay. So um, thank you everybody. Uh, it was a good one hour session. I hope you guys have fun and you have learned something as well. Uh, we hope to meet up in the next meetup in August. Okay, so um, I'll see you guys again.